Uh, so I'm really going to pick up on the practical implications of uh, the Mental Capacity Act and probably will concentrate on assessment as uh, uh, Toby uh, has touched quite a bit on the best interests. Okay. When you might question capacity, first of all, the person has to have a mental disorder as defined by the MCA. Uh, probably going to it, it may appear as I'm going to contradict what was said earlier, but if you're working with someone who does have uh, a mental disorder as defined by the MCA, and they're making a series of several unwise decisions. It doesn't mean they lack capacity. Steve, I, sorry, um, some people are indicating they can't hear. Okay, I don't know sorry. whether we can turn the microphone up or perhaps you could just speak a bit louder. Yeah. Thank you. Is sorry, that better? Sorry. Okay. Uh, so if you're working with someone that ha does have a mental disorder as defined by the uh, MCA, and they are making a series of unwise decisions, it doesn't mean they lack capacity, but I would say that uh, some extra emphasis needs to be placed on the actual assessment and perhaps looking at the assessments previously. If you believe the person is being coerced, they're suggestible or more likely to acquiesce, uh, you know, and then you might begin to question that individual's uh, ability to make a particular decision. Some of the common scenarios which have already been mentioned, which uh, you may be involved in to assess capacity, We've heard it should be decision specific and someone may be able to make one decision but not be able to make another. You know, it can be partial, temporary. I mean, a lot of cast aspersions, any of you find people here, but 12 o'clock tomorrow night, you may lack capacity. 12 hours later on Saturday morning, you may have regained it. So it changes, it fluctuates. So who assesses capacity? This will normally be the person which, who would implement the decision if it was going to go ahead and the person agreed. So in the case of surgery, a surgeon, dental, dentist, etc. But it would be very good practice for that assessor to involve parents, family, support workers, health and social care professionals in that assessment, people that know the individual well and specifically the way the person communicates. Uh, Second principle of the Act, especially important for people with learning disabilities, you know, we have a responsibility to enhance capacity, to show that we've, to demonstrate that we've given enough information in a way that is accessible to that individual and their individual communication needs. Uh, at, the, at this point, we're actually giving the person information. If you're assessing capacity, this would be the same time where you would be setting the bar, the pass mark for your assessment. Because in, in order to give the person the information, they need to make the decision. You need to know what information they need to have. So you give an example of any medication out of the British National Formulary will come with a whole range of possible side effects. And it would be impossible for anyone to remember every single one. So that person who we're assessing their capacity, they need to be given information on A, the likelihood, the ones that are more likely to happen, or B, the ones that will have the greatest impact. Uh, so they wouldn't need to remember every single side effect of uh, paracetamol. Oh, I'll give you an example. If any of us were going, or anybody with a learning disability at all, was going for a general anaesthetic, you would be required to know under your capacity assessment that there's a one in a quarter million chance of dying through that procedure if you actually, uh, or, uh, uh, an average uh, person, it may increase with certain other conditions. So you'd need to know that because of having the greatest impact. <laughs> uh, the status approach to capacity, which uh, Toby mentioned, the other one would be the outcome approach, which you may have seen implemented in the past. I'll give you an example, I take my nephews out to McDonald's uh, Saturday afternoon. I'll go to them, what would you like to drink? They will, each of four of them will go uh, uh, Coke. I'll say, no, you can't have a Coke and have an orange or a milkshake. So you let the person make the decision, you don't agree with it, then you take it away and you make the decision. Uh, the functional test uh, has four stages uh, and, and an individual needs to pass all four stages of this test. So they need to show that they've understood the information relating to that decision, they've remembered it long enough to make the decision uh, and this, through experience, this, the third one, would be the one where sometimes people with learning abilities may uh, fail on if, if they are going to fail, would be to show that they've actually used and weighed the information as part of their uh, decision-making process, and they need to be able to communicate their decision. So in terms of a, a couple of scenarios, in terms of medical treatment, 
The person just needs to understand in simple, plain English terms what the medical treatment is. They don't need to know the ins and outs and the medical jargon. They need to know why it's being proposed, uh, what's its prin principal benefits, risks, uh, and, in, and also the same for any alternatives as well. But they also need to understand what broad terms would consequences of actually, you know, saying no. Also, and if you're doing an actual assessment of capacity with someone with a learning disability, you may have a history of uh, not being able to make their decisions in the past, people taking that privilege away from them. They may not know that they have the opportunity to say no. So that should be one of your key questions. Do you know that you can say no to this? Or if they agree into the uh, a medical procedure or another kind of uh, decision, do you know that you, the person needs to know that they can pull out at any time? They can stop taking that medication. They don't have to do uh, what you're, what's being proposed. They can change their mind. Uh, some information you might need to give them. So you need to give them information uh, and perhaps translate it into an accessible format. There's lots and lots of resources out there these days. Easyhealth.org.uk is an excellent resource. So some of the questions you might start off with just a very broad question, could you tell me what we were talking about earlier? And you may get all the information you need back from that one question. If not, you may need to start to asking some different probing questions. So what are good things about having this done? Will it make the cancer go away? Will it make me better? What are the bad things? They might tell you it might not work. I will feel very sick. So it's important about setting the bar. What do you want to hear back from the person to say they have capacity or they don't? And the bar for someone with a learning disability or dementia or anybody else defined under the MCA is exactly the same. It shouldn't be lowered or should not be hired for, uh, for any particular group. What needs to happen is you might need to change the way that you're giving information to the person. You might need to change the questions you're asking them. But the information should be the same. And I would suggest to you, if you come across anybody that's lowering the bar, it's because they're imposing their own values on the individual. They want that person to have this treatment, they want them to say yes. If they're higher in the bar, the pass mark, it's likely that they don't want the person to have this treatment intervention uh, and they're trying to stop them from having it. Uh, a big issue for uh, social workers at the moment, care managers, uh, capacity to engage in a tenancy agreement. So some of the information that might be given to individuals, you'll be living in this house with this, these people, you'll be paying rent, it means you have to pay this amount on this date of the month, you have to pay for food, electricity bills, etc. You need to take care of the house. That means you have to make sure you look after the things, etc. So if you don't pay the rent or pay the bills, you may be told you can't live there anymore. The person who owns the house, this is who you pay rent to, is the housing association. They have to do things for you because you're living there. They have to let you live here, and make sure things work, etc. So it's about giving them the right information and then asking questions to actually test whether they've understood that information, they've remembered it, and they've used and weighed it in their decision-making process. So I said you'd be paying money called rent. Can you tell me how much you'd be paying? Can you tell me why you have to pay it? What else do you have to pay for? Bills, etc. What happens if you don't pay? Uh, this is probably my most important uh, slide. I keep saying the, way, the word uh, words set the bar and pass mark, etc. But it really is a conversation, it's not an exam. You know, it's about sit making the person feel as easy as possible and trying to enhance capacity, allowing, supporting people to, you know, make their own decisions. Uh, there's no prescribed amount of knowledge as the person has to demonstrate. So it's a, you know, balance of probability. It's a judgment made by the person that's uh, assessing the individual's capacity. What they need to show is evidence if it's ever questioned, especially, you know, that this is the information I gave the person, these are the questions I asked, this is where I set the bar, and these are the reasons I say yes, they have capacity, or the reasons why I say no, they lack it. A couple of uh, last slides. Uh, models of decision making. Obviously, if you have capacity, you can make your own decision. Anybody, if they have capacity, can make an advanced decision. Uh, you can only to refuse treatment, not to demand it. Uh, the approach used in the States, substituted judgment. What would I do if I was standing in that person's shoes? Uh, some researchers suggest, though, uh, they took a uh, number of people who uh, 
were, were likely to lose capacity in the future and who would they ch would choose as their substituted judgment maker. And answers only uh, were the same in 75% of cases. 25% of people who were making decisions on behalf of other people was not the decision that the person would have made themselves. So the approach in this country, uh, in England and Wales, is the best interest approach which uh, uh, Toby mentioned. Uh, now, I won't go through all of these cases, I'll choose one. Uh, these are lots of the cases that help develop the Mental Capacity Act have included people with learning disabilities. Uh, the first one I'll, I'll concentrate on is Re Y. Y is uh, a young lady with uh, learning disabilities, high support needs. Uh, she has close contact with her mum and her sister. Unfortunately, her sister has de developed a rare form of uh, leukaemia and requires a bone marrow transplant. Uh, just through previous investigations, they know that Y is a match. Uh, it's been assessed that uh, Y lacks the capacity to make the decision whether she should uh, donate her bone marrow. So some of the things that they considered uh, when making this decision. Uh, if it went ahead, Y would continue to enjoy visits from her mum and sister. So they're looking at the relationships there. Uh, she has a good relationship with both her mum and sister. If sister becomes unwell, visits from mum would reduce. So it's going to affect her social welfare. Uh, strong possibility sister would die without a transplant. And we know that she has a good relationship with her sister. So that relationship would end. Uh, Sister was more likely to recover with wise bone marrow. Uh, though it's her sister's best interest, is, uh, is not the issue. Sister's survival is in wise best interests. So I suppose the point there is you never consider how a best interest decision will impact on somebody else unless it impacts directly back on the person themselves. Because it's only about what's in the best interests of that individual. And in this case, why? Uh, the operation would be traumatic and uncomfortable. Uh, but we do know that Y's been through two general anaesthetics before uh, and she has no greater risk than the rest of the population. Family could support her through the procedure. Uh, she could have painkillers following the operation and they said yes, uh, that her bone marrow could be uh, harvested. Could you, could you um, just make some concluding comments? Yeah, please? sure. Okay. Yeah, just to say that the Mental Capacity Act, uh, when making best interests, say you should use a balance sheet approach. Uh, and should look at it from three different perspectives, uh, the medical perspective, social welfare and emotional perspective. Uh, and you should look at the possible disadvantages and advantages from both and then make a decision based on which uh, outbalances the other. Thank you.